Boom. Okay. We are live. Perfect. Good Good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Obviously racing yesterday, so feeling a little bit sore and fatigued and like I should still be in bed, but no. Up and Adam. Yeah. <laughs> I was say that this morning when we were messaging before uh, before doing this. I was I was like, do you know what? I, I, if she if she cancels, it would probably not be a bad thing today because it's just uh, I'd be like, oh, I'll just roll back over, have another two hours in bed. Now, to be fair, like the sleep last night's done me a world of good, but like you said, you you just feel it, and you? you just feel, uh, yeah, you just your whole body's yeah. aching and and just not uh, a bit drained. I think is the word. Uh, funny enough, I just seen your post actually while you were making a cup of tea before we started. So you had third place at the Centurion. Yes, again, third, you? second year in a row now. So I wish I'm happy with. I wasn't okay. expecting much from this year. It's been a stacked year of races. I haven't had a weekend off. It feels like for forever. So yeah, I was I was glad to get it done. I had a, a couple of dark places and went to a dark place on the run. I was thinking, oh, do I just pull out? You know, but I'm stubborn, so I, you know, I kept mm -hmm. going. <laughs> Awesome. No, it's a tough uh, it's a tough course as well when it was quite warm um so yeah no, I, I just think everybody felt it on the run you could just see people's faces when they came in like it hit people for six um for anyone listening who doesn't know what we're talking about um it's the mumble centurion is a hundred kilometer cent well yeah triathlon over three days um and the run was yesterday so uh, we both did this and maddie got third place so that's just for a bit more context <laughs> Um, so do you want to just give a bit of an intro into like who you are? Obviously we've known each other for years mm -hmm. anyway, but even I don't know <laughs> everything that you do. So <laughs> it'd be good to just, yeah, get the full picture. Cool. Right so there. I'm first and foremost a yoga teacher. Um, so I teach public classes. I work with a lot of athletes. Um, and with that, I also work uh, with some GP surgeries. So I get referrals to me for either mental health. Um, people struggling with their mental health or with pain in the body and we do like group sessions to help them so they get free sessions on the, the NHS but then I also do kind of sports massage, cupping, acupuncture and then I also am studying a psychology degree and with that I run the mental toolbox which is just like a free platform offering content and little bits to help people um who might be struggling with some aspect of their mental health or well-being or just even um, their mindset and eventually, I'd like to be offering more courses and support there and workshops. Um, so, yeah, that is the goal. Awesome. You touched on a, part of a question that I was going to ask later on, which was if it's sort of future yeah. plans. But, um, yeah, yeah no, if it, with the mental toolbox. So, um, I, I, I followed it initially, I think, before I knew it mm -hmm. was you. Um, and I just love the stuff that you put on there because there's so much useful uh, content you can see you put a lot of time and effort into each post and uh, you know and I can guarantee that it is helping people when they're reading it as well um, so with the uh, well it's on in, just on Instagram or have you got, got a website, website well? yes so there is like I ran my first course um, oh god a few months ago so that's there people can sign up to it but I'm still refining it now to, for it to go live again um, and I'll be offering mm. more online stuff there as well so that's the metal toolbox online um, so yeah, it's going to be, it'll be, it'll be bigger soon, but it, it is there if anybody wants a little nose and have a little read about what I do. Awesome. And I, it's a psychology degree. What year are First you First year. So I'm doing it online so I can still run the business and, and train yeah. and, uh, and get the degree done. So yeah, psychology with counselling. Don't know where I want to go with it. I like the brain. I like neuroscience, but I also like sports, so I like sports psychology. So it's kind of just going to be the gateway to see where when I finish the degree where I want to kind of hone in on really. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, you know, that's really interesting because like you, like you said, it's quite, it, it's a very challenging subject mm -hmm. to learn about because there's so many different avenues to explore with it. But the fact that you're doing that alongside running a business and um, are you actually, right, so are you actually a, um, you're like a sponsored athlete? No, yeah, is that, is that well, I guess you it, could or? say that. So I have a coach who sponsors me. So he trains me um, and keeps me in one piece, basically. <laughs> if I get any niggles, mm -hmm. then I am part of Team Brav. So we're not. A, I'm not essentially a sponsored athlete by by Brav, but they they support me with all my kit, and we are we're just basically like a family that all really believe in the brand and want to be there to represent and be out in the field of triathlon 
you know, as like a point of contact. So we've had loads of amazing feedback on about the socks, for example, that Brad put together. And some people said, oh, what's some shorter socks? So we started going into shorter socks now. And it's just nice to be like that kind of in between the brand and the public and kind of meshing. Yeah, it's, it's nice. I love the stuff that Brad yeah. does, actually. I've got, I've probably got like six pairs of the socks. They're so funky. Now, I think. So the ones with Craig Jones. And, oh, they're amazing. They are. You just, we can wear them just cutting about in the house or just with sliders or whatever, or actually when you're running. I'd never have any uh, blisters or anything when I'm Yeah, running I used them the yesterday. And I, you know, to be fair, my feet, my feet are all right. I mean, they're a bit battered, but that's, that comes to the part and parcel with their trail running. But yeah, I, I love the socks. They're great. They're great. I just like that they're funky. They're different. They're awesome patterns and they, they do stand out which is which is cool i'm loving the colors you've got on right now as well you've uh you're kind of matching with the plant in the background as well yeah. like looking really colorful and got me in like a boring sort of gray i don't even know what color this is I i'm think it's actually like, it is a gray, it's hijack in my uh housemate's room so this is her plant which is in the corner you actually know her summer so she, yeah so i've hijacked yes, her room while she's in work because yeah. my room's not as pretty as her so <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i know yeah, i know summer she's lovely yeah she's brilliant yeah f first time i ever met summer she, what she say we, we she came for a dip actually and I, I i have a tendency to turn up late for things right it's just this is who i am i accept it now um and uh summer's like quite straight to the point but with like a sort of a like a cheeky um, twist <laughs> yeah like a cheeky twist. There's a, there's a, i can't remember the um bland humor yeah. is it i can't remember the exact it's expression but she kind of just said something to me about me being late and I was like oh, oh hi nice to meet you and she was like I'm only joking but initially I thought she was gonna she was gonna punch me in the face you know, love it. Yeah. <laughs> you know there you go. love it love it <laughs> um okay so triathlons let's get into actually no no let's go a bit even further back than that but actually so what before yoga what what were you doing like what, how because you've been doing it for like six seven, seven years seven, now seven yeah years? so I you know we're going to go way back I went to school you know Went to college, did subjects I thought were clever, like maths, chemistry, biology, psychology, and history. I did five A levels, thought I could do them all. Bloody couldn't. Mm -hmm. Dropped out. Went mm -hmm. back the second year doing four maths, chemistry, biology, and history, and was like, what am I doing? I, I'm not enjoying it. I want to work. I want to earn my own money. So I went into an apprenticeship in dentistry, and I went. I worked as a dental nurse for oh, maybe five, six years, and then decided one day I don't want to do this. I want to go travelling. So. I went and booked a one-way ticket um, to Australia. And that's where I really fell in love with yoga. I always did a bit of yoga, like, as a practice, but it was more just a stretch. You know, it wasn't, it didn't have any deeper meaning to it other than I'm going to go have a nice stretch. And then when I was in um, mm. Australia, I met this fantastic South African woman. I lived on her island that her and her husband owned, and she was heavily pregnant, but a yoga teacher. And we were, like, doing some yoga together. Yeah, there's yoga an island. island. It wasn't a yoga island. It was just an island off of Australia that they owned. And it used to be the 4X, like, beer island. But they had it. It's called Pumpkin mm. Island. And you could just go and rent the island and stay there, basically. It was, like, a like a luxury, like, accommodation and, and stuff. It was insane. But I was, mm. like, lucky enough to live there for free in exchange for, like, a few hours work a day. And the, the work was, like, cleaning some of the, like, um, the accommodation there which was lovely or picking up coconuts off the beach <laughs> like it wasn't it wasn't a hard gig you know for the rewards that I was getting of being there you know and yeah that's where I really fell in love I, with I yoga. Can think of some words she was there. telling me about yoga and this ashram in India and she made it sound incredible and as soon as I got back from Australia I booked my ticket to India to go do my yoga teacher training I wasn't planning to be a yoga teacher I just really wanted to learn about like, the roots of yoga I had a lot of interest in the lifestyle of it and a lot of it really you know like everything about they have like the um the, the principles of, of yoga like yamas and niyamas and a lot of it just fit with what I already believed in and what I already tried to live my life like and I loved it well I mean it's quite brutal out there it's 40 degree heat you were up at five every morning it was you know a jam-packed day and it was different yoga to here obviously it's way it's really authentic um and yeah I came home from India with this yoga teaching qualification and I just thought I'll teach my friends and family and it just kind of went from there they started bringing their friends and their friends and I was like oh I have to start teaching another class it was full and yeah it kind of just snowballed which is incredible really to think about it like how how I never expected that to happen and now it's like my life <laughs> it's crazy. Mm. 
And and you know what though, I think like this. I'm big on this as well. Like when you start doing things that are aligned to like who mm-hmm. you are as a person, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like work for one. But also, I think th- there's this sort of like. I, I don't know, but people almost get drawn to it. They kind of know that you're doing it for, you know, because you love it and or because you enjoy it, whatever. And then I think people 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 feel drawn to you or to what you're doing in in that sense, um, you know. And I think it's it's just yeah. so important, isn't it? Trying to when you actually hit, hit the right trajectory for you, everything just sort of clicks into place. And you've also got to be willing to kind of allow the road to take you. Yeah. Where it's going to take you, like for example, if you're in Australia, and then like you say, you just thought, oh, you know, mm-hmm. I want to do yoga, do want to do this yoga now, booking a flight to India, and then just going and do it, and then that's so impulsive, yeah. um, but at the same time, it's so like, it, you know, so rewarding, and you can look back on that and think, okay, it was a big decision, but look what's come since, you know, and, and it, it just helps you trust yeah, yourself. Yeah, absolutely, a bit, and you know, I think. Everyone thought I was bonkers going from like a really steady job, you know, in a good career in dentistry. And I had so much like of ways I could have gone there to, to work my way up. But I was just like, it's not for me. Like, I don't like the hours. I don't really like teeth. <laughs> like, OK, it's stable and it gives me that security, but I'm not feeling fulfilled. And, you know, being self-employed, it, it's a risk in many ways. And there's no, you know, definitive way of how things are going to go. You don't know. But. I kind of like that. I kind of like that there's so many opportunities. You've just got to take the right ones, I guess, you know, and and you do take some wrong ones. I've done that and you learn from it. And I don't see anything as a failure. I think I was so scared of failure for such a long time when I was like, actually, the only failure is not doing something. That's when you fail. Like if you try something and it doesn't work out, I don't see that as failure. I just see it as, OK, it's a lesson. Don't do that again, you know go a different path and that's that's kind of been mm. uh, what i've been learning so in the last few years like it's okay to fail it's oh, fail because it's not failure because you're, you're doing act you know if you take action i always say then you're not failing you're, you're doing something good yeah yeah for, for people have got this real sort of like and i you know i say people mm. i mean everybody i mean like me included we've got this fear of failure um you know which is sort of inherent in it in us we don't like to we don't like the idea of something not going our way, which is, you know, very understandable. Do you know what I mean? It's, uh, we can forgive ourselves for that. But like you said, I think just recognizing, hang on, you know, just because this hasn't worked out doesn't mean that it's never going to work out or doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it says anything about me as an individual. It just means that something hasn't worked or there's lessons, like you said, that are hidden in there. You can kind of pluck out and go okay actually yeah I can I can see why this didn't work now what am I going to do or what can I do to make it work in the future or to make sure that I'm more more aware of it and um I, funny enough I after shutting my second business right I was literally I was like smiling and laughing and my business partner's like why are you so excited like this is a yeah. horrible day I was like well I said yeah you know it, it is but at the same time I was like it just means that we you know we're going to learn so much from this experience and then you know it's going to help us to move forward and to do whatever else in the future that's going to you know help us mm-hmm. long term you know what i mean i just kind of that was my, my mindset at the time and he was just looking at me he was just like what are you talking about but it, it made sense to me yeah, anyway, absolutely. you know he was just looking for those lessons and uh, and it's important that you said then it's important to know when to let go of something because sometimes something can be going not the way you want it if you hang on because you put so much energy into it and you keep pushing 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 because you're like oh it'll it'll change sometimes it doesn't and it's it's knowing that point where okay like something's got to go now like something's got to change because if i continue down this path where am i going to be in the next six months it's not going the way it's probably going to be even worse so like let's change the narrative in some way and see where that takes us and maybe that will take us on another downhill who knows or maybe it will take us the other way and we'll start climbing so I think it's learning want to trust yourself and be and get comfortable with failure I always say failure because I don't see it as failure but also knowing when to let go of mm-hmm. something and when it's time to to change to change like the narrative for sure yeah no and I think with the so, so with the triathlons and stuff like that, actually, so that like that kind of side of things. I mean, where did that kind of fit in to everything you? So you obviously 
always been passionate about health and fitness. I think that's fair to say, isn't it? But sort of where did that slip into it? Do you know what I mean? When do you think I actually start doing that kind of stuff well, and the running and whatever? It's interesting you say I've yeah. always been into health and fitness because I have on the surface, but without going into it too much because otherwise we'd mm. be talking about it for hours, I used to struggle with um, an eating disorder. So whilst I looked fit and healthy on the outside because I was going to the gym and I was eating well, I was actually internally my mindset was in a well my mind was in a really bad place because I was obsessed I was obsessed with food I was obsessed with with training and I literally used to just to train to lose weight as most you know we all have this story especially I know guys get it as well I know a lot of females that I've worked with myself that struggle with how they look um and for a long time whilst I looked everyone thought Maddie was the fitness friend and Maddie was this health and and well-being girl it was well it looked like that yes but it, it in reality it was the total opposite and I tried so many different sports because I needed something to you know I was weightlifting I've tried bodybuilding it wasn't because I wanted to be a bodybuilder I just wanted to look a certain way and then I went to jiu-jitsu which I loved because it was so like challenging mentally and it was just bonkers but I probably stopped that mainly one because I kept getting injured <laughs> but two because I was like I'm not losing mm. enough weight literally it came down to that and I started running and running and running then. And you know, as you know, running's quite hard on the body. And I got injured to the point where they were like, right, if you've got a torn uh, labrum in your hip, so you either give up what you're doing, which was jujitsu and running, or you have surgery, but you're a bit young. We don't want to have surgery yet. So blah, blah, blah. So I didn't, I didn't like either option. Didn't want surgery. Didn't want to give up what I was doing. And I happened to be teaching yoga in a triathlon center at the time. And they were like, oh, well, if you can't run, why don't you go on the walk bike? And I was like, oh, cycling, meh, not really for me. But I did it anyway, got on. And they were like, oh, you're quite strong, actually. And it, it gave me no pain in the hip, which was amazing. And I got a good sweat on. And at the time, I didn't care about the watts. I was like, oh, how many calories can I burn? You know, that that was me at that point. But then I got more into cycling. And they were like, why don't you try some open water swimming? And I was like, oh, I don't really swim. I, I can swim, but I don't like to. And it kind of went from there. And I, to be honest, when I first started triathlon, it was just to make me look a certain way. It was just to lose weight. And over that period, and then getting into the watts and being like, oh, well, if I want to get hit more watts, actually, I need to eat more, I need to get stronger. And I just sort of like, I wouldn't say it was just triathlon that helped me shift my mindset, but it was a massive tool to get me out of this obsession with how many calories can I burn to the more performance side. And like now it's all like, well, I eat like an absolute elephant. <laughs> I'm ridiculous with what I do. I eat a lot of food. Um, and I just, it's like, I do say like triathlon is like my therapy. Like it's so soothing. I mean, it hurts my body. <laughs> my mind's quite tired, but it's like, it's soothing for me. It, it's, I can't imagine having a life without triathlon now. It's, it's amazing. And the community is amazing as well. I, I was going to say the community side of it seems like what, that, that, that seems like what a kind of molds people together or keeps people together with it because, um, you know, it, it is a very, so it's very challenging because you've got these multi-disciplines that you kind of, if you want to progress within triathlons, you have to kind of, yeah. you know, you, you've got yeah. to work on each one of them, haven't you? You know, rather than like, not like what I do, which is just do running, but then don't do the swim or the bike and then just turn Wing up it. on the day and <laughs> like nearly die. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but like you said, it, the, the community just seems amazing. I think that's what, one of the key things I wanted to touch on t today as well, really is, um, you know, that, that that connection side of things, you know. So how do you feel like that, you know, impacts people's lives from having that sort of sense of community where you're all predicated upon doing something physically and mentally good for you uh, whilst also kind of challenging yourself? So it's the same as, like, running groups or whatever. Like, I mean, how do you feel like that um, helps people day to day? You know, is, is there anything notable you can yeah, think Yeah, I think it's like, it's like things? a family, you know, like... like the way I've been talking about this a lot recently with people is, for example, taking like, us female athletes, you know, like women's sport is always a bit behind men's sport. But in like West and South Wales, we have a really good stack of female athletes. Like there's so many amazing, really, you know, really good athletes. And, you know, we all compete against one another. Yet the other week we all did a, uh, a cycle mm. together. We went for food and we like, you know, we'll pass each other on the bike and we're all like, good luck, keep going. And it's such a nice community feel which you don't always get obviously maybe I should be more like nope I'm gonna go I'm gonna drop them but I I, I love that community feel I think one of my first races this year one of my friends Kath I overtook on the run and we had a hug mid-run I was like what are you doing I was like we 
was good. We're both struggling. Let's have a hug. And then I carried on. And I think it's really nice having that community because I think, like, none, none of my friends, really, like, immediate friends do things like triathlon. So it's nice to have, like, your own family. Because they don't understand what I do, I don't think. They think I'm bonkers that I spend my weekends, you know, doing all this running and all this cycling and, you know, on the bike for six hours and on the weekend is normal for me. And my friends think I'm bonkers. But then you've got those people that understand. So I think it's nice to have people that you can still share this, like, you know, journey with who get it and are in it with you. So, and it's through triathlon that I've met, you know, I met my boyfriend through triathlon. I've met some of my best friends. I met brav you know adam who who runs brav obviously through triathlon so it's opened so many opportunities for me and i know it's opened so many opportunities for other people as well and it's brought people you know together like i've got friends now up you know like ronda way and in down west and people i would never ever have met really or connected with at least if it wasn't for triathlon so i just think it's it's really special family especially within clubs as well like we've got swansea they'll try that i'm a part of you know, we have a WhatsApp group, it's great banter. We, you know, there's there's things on every week, like multiple times a week. So you've always got somebody to train with or to chat with. And if you have any problems, there's always people there. And they all lift you up. You know, if I have a crappy race and I'm just like, oh, it was crap. You know, they're always there, like, you know, reminding you of like how far you've come. And I think it's just, it's a really special community for sure. That, you know, I, I love that actually. Like you said, it, it's it, when you were saying it then, it's it just reminds mm-hmm. me so the the wet band that's the sea dipping group it's mm-hmm. uh, you know the, the the fact that you can put a message in and mm-hmm. if you want support with something or if you want to do something yeah uh th- there's always someone up for it you know mm-hmm. there's always someone like oh yeah i'll come to a waterfall or i'll do this or i'll do that and um and i think like you said that is when you find like that group of people who just enjoy those particular things that you enjoy that you know and, and make you feel at home you know, so yeah. you're not feeling alien, like what you said there. Like a lot of my friends, yeah. you know, and family, they just don't understand, you know, the stuff that like, I, you know, with the runs and um, going in the sea mm-hmm. through the winter, like people don't get it. Um, or if they do, they'll still like alienate you a little well, bit yeah. just because it's a bit like so far fetched, you know. But when you find people who are on board with that kind of stuff and will do it with you, like you said, it just, it makes you... Uh, it makes you think actually yeah i'm not yeah. so i'm not so crazy after all like i am actually you know mm-hmm. th- there's something to this you know so i think it's important to find people like that um the um going back to the mm-hmm. um like eating disorder you like are you yeah do, do you want to like yeah absolutely talk more about that are you happy i think i think with that? being a young girl having magazines it all started back you know in primary school probably um i was always mm. very skinny and quite tall for my age i kind of grew to height and then everyone caught up with me um but so i was never i was never a big girl i did ballet you know i was very muscly and a horse i had horses so i was riding horses again so i was super muscly legs whereas all my friends weren't as developed within their legs as i was like i was just like the skinny scrawny girl with quads <laughs> there's a picture of me as a like in my ballet in my ballet outfit as a kid like pointing my toe for like a ballet shoot we were doing and i'm, I'm just like skin and bone quads skin and bone like that was it okay and i was so conscious <laughs> of it because to me my legs were big, you know, I didn't see them as muscly, I saw them as big, you know, I didn't see them as powerful, I just saw them as bloody big, that was like how I described my legs, and I always remember I wouldn't want to wear jeans, I wouldn't want, I'd only want to wear skirts, because then you couldn't see my, you know, that my thighs touch, and I didn't have a thigh gap, it was like really silly things like that, no one ever was horrible about how I looked, it was all very internalised, but I think when you're seeing things in the media, I always buy the magazines, you know, these like teen magazines, it was comparing one celeb to another, who wore it best, and picking out their wrinkles under their armpit, so I think you're always feeling like you're under scrutiny from everybody, just because of what you're viewing, and I always remember I was obsessed with weighing myself, Mm. my mother again, fab, she looked amazing, I think she's beautiful, but she was always pulling herself down in front of me, so I think I thought you had to pick yourself apart for a long time. And it, it was never really an eating disorder. I was always just very conscious of what I ate. Very, you know, it was always be salads. I'd feel a bit guilty if I ate sugar or chocolate. And then when I left school, I can't remember exactly, but it, it got, it turned obsessive. This is when I went into bodybuilding. So you were, you know, you were praised for weighing all your food. You were praised for having that cheap meal. You know, you were praised for kind of restricting yourself and then having a binge day kind of thing and I got into that cycle of restrict 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 binge then feel so guilty that I binge and I make myself sick 
and that was kind of the cycle that I went on for years and I kind of thought it was normal because I thought well I'm doing bodybuilding like you've got to make sacrifices to like a certain way you know that was how I justified it in my own mind but I also kept it secret from my friends so they knew I weighed my food because I go to a restaurant and I would bring my scales like they thought I was bonkers but I was like no no I'm just really you know I'm really like determined to do well kind of gal which is stupid (laughs) and um I remember one of my friends like going for a walk with me and I, I remember it so vividly we walk in from like Caswell to Lang on the coast of past she's like man you've got a problem and I was like what do you mean and she's like yeah you're obsessed like and I was like trying to justify she's like look just listen like I'm worried about you like and I kind of got defensive as I do I'm very stubborn and you know kind of put my wall up and was like you know whatever like I kind of agreed with her I was like whatever in my head and she didn't know about the being sick at this point or the or the bulimia and then I got pulled up on it in work because someone had heard me being sick in the staff room and I blamed it on oh I'd accidentally eaten something bad and it made me feel sick and I started to realize I was lying to people and that didn't sit well with me but I was trying to protect myself from them knowing because I knew I think obviously I knew it was wrong to make yourself sick but I didn't want to admit that to myself because it was kind of comforting knowing I could eat something but then just bring it back up you know I could enjoy the taste and I could get it back up and I don't really know like a definitive when that stopped but I did go to I paid for I went to see a mental health nurse through the NHS but the wait because I wasn't suicidal you know the the wait list was like two years and I was thinking I don't know if I can wait that long so I I paid for therapy um and the guy basically said, no, you haven't got an eating disorder. Like, let's go back to your childhood. And, you know, <laughs> went through, like, with a fine-tooth comb through everything I've ever experienced. And when I first, you know, felt crappy about my body. And I just didn't think it was working for me, that kind of therapy. I was a bit like, Pff. I'm talking about it, but there's, I don't feel like anything's changing. I'm very impatient. So I actually went to hypnotherapy. I had three sessions. And after the three, he's like, I, I won't see you there for six months. And I was like, oh, like, I'm not fixed. He's like, just go away come back in six months or put a reminder in your phone for six months to give me a call and we'll see where you're at so I remember having the three sessions and thinking well that was a waste of money you know like I don't feel any different and then I remember being about a couple months after that and I was like holy shit I have not been sick I've not made myself sick for a while like huh and I was a bit sus I was like huh you know I still wasn't like completely normal as in I wasn't you know I still had a bad relationship with food at this point um but then the six months came and I was like, I feel so much better in myself. And I'd say now for the like the last year, about 12 months, I am I feel like I've really overcome it. Um, but after that, that was maybe four or five years ago that this ther- I had this therapy. And it's it took up until like I said a year ago. I'd, I'd have little ups and downs, but I feel like I finally conquered it, which sounds a bit horrible because I know a lot of people struggle with it forever. And I feel very fortunate that I don't think twice about what I eat now. Like, I don't eat calories. I actually, the more calories, the better for me. I'm like, yes, I can eat less for more because I struggle to get volume in. And <laughs> yeah, it, it took a lot of a lot of soul searching to come over. It wasn't just as simple as therapy. It's a lot of self-healing. I did bonkers things like shaking meditation and all this kind of, these different practices and holistic practices to, to see what would work for me. And I found the ones that did. Hence why I try and share them all on the metal toolbox now in different ways that you can you know self-heal but yeah it was a journey and it you know it makes me so sad when I see people now like struggling with their body because I know how hard it is to overcome and what worked for me I could tell them step by step what I did but will it work for them probably not like I think it's so individualistic and yeah it's tough really tough Do you know that, that I like? I had no idea about that. No, no, you know about you as well. So no, thank you for you no know, talking about that. I think that's such an important thing um, to, to get out there as well. Because like you said, I, you know, there's probably mm-hmm. more people out there which are struggling with it that you know people don't realise. Because like you said, there if you were, you know, it's not something you no. want to potentially own up to you you know to yourself or or to other people. Um, and this is what comes in, you know, when it comes into the mental health side of things as well like you know, about us talking about our feelings you know we can open up and talk about our feelings but that also includes sort of it, it, it what's the word yeah. i'm looking for a kind of um vulnerability you yeah. know it's about being vulnerable you know around people and and to ourselves isn't it because i think once you show that mm-hmm. vulnerability you're allowing yourself to start healing you know and also allowing others to uh to kind of step in and and, and support you 
So it is. It's a, it's a really important step. But that's. Um, it, well, I mean, so you, do you think that well, there was one particular thing that stood out in terms of how you dealt with it, or do you think it was just a combination of, of things? Uh, and also, you know, primarily the, the thing that started it was probably the, yeah. the therapy and the and therapy was it, and then the rest sort of. Yeah. Kind of yeah, it's like well, the way I think of it when it when it comes down to what I struggled with my eating and my body, you know, body dysmorphia. Like I always try to think what triggered it, you know, originally. Like I said, there was magazines, but I don't think it was just that. But what I came to realize through this therapy, which I think the therapy was help, it was healing, not because it healed the eating disorder, it healed the pain that I. So I used the, the eating disorder was just a symptom of a worse off problem, basically. So what I found, I you know, my I had a great mum and dad. I still have a great mum and dad. They're still with us. They're fat. They're fab people, um, but they they split when I was fifteen, and it was very toxic. Up until they split, they were just they were they weren't meant to be, you know. And it was a it was a hard environment to grow up in. I feel very fortunate, you know. I had you know a roof over my head. I you know I had a wealthy family. I had everything I could have wanted, but I didn't have that emotional care really that I needed. Like they weren't horrible to me and my sister. Like so, so mum and dad, if you do see this, I'm not slagging you off, but. Um, it wasn't a great environment to grow up in at that age and like that I think that was part of it and I found I think I used my eating disorder as I got older to because I felt like sort of control in all aspects of my life because I couldn't control what was going on with my parents I couldn't control this that and the other that was something I could control I could control what I put in my body and I could control this like the being sick thing was kind of like I was in control like it was up to me if I wanted that to be in, in me or not it was a really warped sense of having this control over one aspect of my life. So I think there were so many things that contributed towards this eating disorder, but then there's so many things that contributed to get me out. Like my friends were definitely one of them when I did start to open up and talk about it. Like you said, being vulnerable is really hard. Like I'm very good at being angry because I feel that strong, you know, and not very good at being showing I'm sad. You know, if I am sad, I'll show it as anger because I feel like more... Um, empowered that way because being vulnerable not that I think it's weak but I feel like oh my god if I'm vulnerable like I'm not strong anymore which is so stupid because I really encourage people to be vulnerable I think being vulnerable is the strongest thing you can do for yourself um but I and I think learning that was a big part of my healing was being like it's okay to like not have you know your ducks in a line right you know it's okay if you're not always okay and that was like my biggest help was being reminded that by friends by family by like you know I wrote I read all these books you know like everything was had that same message like it's okay if you're not okay and when I kind of accepted that I was like okay so Mm. and and one thing that really helped me was actually knowing I wasn't the only one you know I joined groups um you know via like Facebook which people go through the same thing and being like oh, I'm not the only one that has these same thoughts. So, and if they've overcome it, then there's no reason why I can't. And and I'm still part of these groups. And it's nice that I can help people who are like saying, I'm struggling with X, Y, and Z. Like I get in these thoughts, what, what you do? And, and we all chip in with our own kind of, this is what helped me try this. And it's like, oh, now it's like I've gone full circle. I'm able to help other people, you know, in it, just by offering little tips and contexts that they might not have, have got to yet. That's that's it. Like, and yeah. it comes back to community again, isn't it? Or connection, doesn't it? Like you said there, the last part. So, uh, having other people to just bounce things off, and again, feeling like you're not alone. Mm-hmm. I think that there's a really good book. I'm going on a slight tangent, but there's a really good book called no, I Connections haven't. by Johan Harry. Have you Another read book. that yet? Awesome. I've got it in the house. I will give it to you. Um, really, really good book. It's uh, his first book mm-hmm. was about reframing how we look at addiction, and that was called Chasing the Scream. Uh, whereas this one is about so sort of lost connections and basically saying why, why, why depression is mm-hmm. sort of as prevalent as it is these days. And he talks about how, you know, that sort of like we when we were in tribes, we all had this little sense mm-hmm. of purpose. You know, you'd have a blacksmith or you'd have this person or that yeah. person and someone doing the cooking or whatever. You know, you'd have, everyone had this little sense of purpose. Um, and then they also had like a good community there as well. So like if they were struggling with something, they would have another person to rely on. And I think these days we are connect- more connected than ever through like say social media, but we do lack then mm-hmm. that sort of person to person 
connection. So like everybody just shuts their doors in the UK. There's nobody that has their doors wide open and neighbours coming in randomly and all that kind of stuff. There's only yeah. smaller villages where I think that may still happen. But it, typically in the city, you're like, well, why would I keep my door open? Somebody might walk in and rob them of my stuff. And it's this, you know, we're a little bit sort of, we've gone inward a little bit now, I think. And that community feel, that tribe feel isn't so much there. And I think that's why these sorts of individual communities, like the triathlon one, the running one, trail running communities, um, you know, the sea dipping one, it just, I think when we have those sorts of, uh, communities even though if people don't feel like they've got like a particular purpose within that community they still feel part of something mm -hmm. and I think that it just gives them that sense of connection and if they're pursuing their own individual sense of purpose through work or through you know being a father mm -hmm. or mother or whatever then it kind of it ticks that box as well um, but yeah no that, that, anyway they're going back to the book yeah it's a really really good uh, interesting book about yeah, how if we get back to that sort of icky guy, that um, sense of purposefulness and, and community and connection that it just, yeah, it, it really takes a lot of boxes that, for like, us. They, that kind of hits but, the nail um, on the head with everything, like you said about triathlon, no, that's like that's what it is, it's that community is, it makes you feel like you're part of something bigger, you know, it's like, out of all the triathlon group, we have some really mm. elite athletes, we have complete newbies, and like everyone just feels like they're part of it all. So like when someone wins, you feel like it's a win for you all, and it's like really exciting. It's like community, you know, like mm. Emily Marchant, who's part of um, Brav and also part of Swansea Girl Try, and me and you know me and her will be racing against each other, you know. And I want nothing more than for her. I know she's better than me, and I'm like, I want nothing but more than for her to win, and that makes me like ecstatic when she wins and it's like people are like yeah but you race against her like she's beating you I'm like yeah but it's like community over competition is always the way I'll see it and like when she wins I'm freaking buzzing like I'm so happy for her and and we're, we're happy for her as a team as well hmm. yeah like like you said it's not I, it, I think when we get caught up in the competition side yeah. of things we're like thinking about it from an individual perspective aren't we we're like ah, oh, you know well I want to win and it's like okay well mm -hmm. you know you can still be yeah. happy for other people and, and be inspired by them I think that's probably the, the key thing is not to mm -hmm. you know it, it becomes a negative doesn't it if you're looking at someone else who's just beaten you in a, a race or whatever in, instead of looking at that and thinking oh well they beat me so I'm not happy until I've beaten them then you're, you're kind of like you're signing a contract with yourself almost to be unhappy until you've fulfilled that and you're constantly swimming against the tide, you know, because if you, if, if it's something that motivates you, you think, right, well, actually this person yeah. beat me, but I want to, I want to use this as a fuel now to actually go back out and to train more and, and to do better, then that's good. But as long as you mm -hmm. look at it from like this perspective that you are, which is like you said, that I'm, I'm happy for, for, for them, like this is you know, an amazing thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and also the fact it helps that you're friends and you, you know, you have that sense of community. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I think that it, some people are just so kind of hell bent on winning that they yeah. kind of, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It, it becomes it does, a negative yeah. in itself then, doesn't it? It's not really, mm. yeah, I'm always, it's only always me against me when I go out and, and do the runs like the, on the trails yesterday. Uh, I kind of, I done terrible on the bike and the swim cause they're just not my thing at all. But the the, yeah. the run, I was like, right, this is my arena now. And I was like, I'm just going to go for it. Um, I did surprise myself, to be fair, because, uh, yeah, I just weren't expecting to have done as, as well as I did on the run. But I, it, it's, it, it didn't matter to me what position I came. Like, I was chuffed with the position I come. But, you mm -hmm. know, as long as I did it and I give Absolutely. everything... Like last, and it was a tougher run this year than last year, year as well. It was actually June, yeah, it was a uh, savage <laughs> and warm. <laughs> yeah, it was warm as well. Um, mm -hmm. I, so yeah. a couple of these posts I've I've got me, I've written them down right. So like uh, we've tapped on one or two of them already, but like um, comparing yourself to others, it was one of the posts you put mm -hmm. up actually on the um, on the mental toolbox, and I I, I kind of I wonder, I know we've talked a little bit about that um already with the like you mentioned about the eating disorder so like even though you like you mentioned magazines was probably one part of of, of it like ge generally day to day now like what we talked about with the training there as well so like comparing yourself up to others what do you feel is the 
How do you feel like that? You can stop that. So someone who's watching this or listening to this now, if they are noticing that they're comparing themselves to others, whether it's in a competitive sense, like what mm-hmm. we just talked about, or, or or like you know, body wise or life wise in general, like in terms of their success, like what do you feel is a good sort of exercise for people to think? Right, actually, let me. I need to stop doing that. Yeah. Oh, I want to stop doing that. I Do think, you know like, what I mean? Is there like, anything you exercise, but I think what we have to remind ourselves is, uh, uh, for example, a lot of the time when I was comparing myself to others, it's usually through social media, it's through looking at celebrities in a magazine, you know, back when I was younger. Mm. And I think, and I know people have compared themselves to me because they're like, oh my God, you look so, you know, your legs are amazing compared to mine. And I'm like, yeah, but you've got to remember we're completely different people, for one, like genetically. When you actually think about it logically, you're like, you know, I'm never going to like you, Ryan, because you're a man, I'm a female. Do you know what I mean? It's like there's so there's there's barriers. And even like me and my sister, we are, you know, from the same two parents and we are vastly different. She's got longer legs and, you know, I'm I'm shorter and she's got a skinnier frame. And I just got like, you know, I'm, I'm littler. So <laughs> I just look a bit more chunky than her. And, and that's OK. And I think what we really have to remind ourselves is sometimes we're comparing our weakness with someone's strength for example in terms of maybe performance so like you said like running is your strength and you could be like swimming you know doing the swim and comparing yourself to someone who's like an ex-pro swimmer so like why why would you compare yourself to them because you're you're in two different kind of categories completely you know like it doesn't make sense they've swam for eight you know since they were eight till the time they were 18 like five times a week whereas you maybe had a way more fun childhood than them you know you don't have to be like in the pool with your coach you know that so you had a different experience mm-hmm. and I think when it comes to comparison it's just I think if I, I could go on about this for ages but I think the most important thing before all of that I think when we can't pair ourselves is there's the deeper problem and that is self-love and self-confidence and self-worth and I think a lot of um problems that we struggle with mentally and our well-being and our mindset if we could work on those three things self-love self-confidence self-esteem like when you get that strong the other things don't matter so much you know like as soon as I never had a lot of self-confidence in myself I didn't trust myself very much because I didn't think I was I was a bit of a sheep I followed other people because I trusted their decisions and what they did more than I would my own because I didn't feel like I was worthy to have good decision making which sounds bizarre now because now I'm like yeah whatever um so I think working on those three things is paramount absolutely paramount self-confidence self-love self-esteem or self-worth Yeah, and, and mm-hmm. you know that that's perfect. Yeah. It does. It centers from those particular things, doesn't it? It literally does. I think once mm-hmm. you start to put stock into your own ability, or you put stock into your own, um, you know, achievements as well. So, like, not just the things that you you, you know, right, right now, mm-hmm. like in terms of characteristics or in terms of what you've got physically and you know, mentally, but actually looking at what you've done and putting stock into that. Because I think, like you said, a lot of people will look um, look to others as achieve others is other people's achievements um and be like oh well you know they've done that and or like let's just use this as an Mm -hmm. example so like you know i've never been to university okay i'm glad i've never been to university because i've never really wanted to invest three years into one particular topic that i've never there's never been that one thing where i thought well i want to spend that much time doing it and that, that I do see people then graduating who were like, you know, a good few years younger than me. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, should I have gone? But then it's like, well, no, hang on. Yeah. You didn't want to go at the time. And I probably would have dropped out if I did go. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, I'm very much at yeah. peace with the fact that I've never been and probably never will go. But I think probably some people will look at the timeline of someone mm-hmm. think who's 21, 22, just finished university doing something. And they might be like, oh, well, you know, I, I don't, I still don't know what I want to do yet. Yeah. And they'll look at that university thing thinking maybe I should have gone to university. And that's, awesome. you know, if you didn't feel like it was the right decision mm-hmm. then, then, you know, that was probably the right thing. You know, it was, you would have just been forcing yourself to do something you don't want to do. And like you mm-hmm. said, it's just Absolutely. recognizing that we are on all these different timelines. And, you know, it sounds cliche when you see things like oh, Walt Disney was bankrupt at 40 and, you know, Steve Jobs was kicked out of his company at 40 odd or whatever Ooh. it is. But I, it's nice to hear those particular like real life examples i think because it just reminds us that yeah everybody's running on a different time frame a different clock and it doesn't mean that you your sort of greatness isn't yet to come 
but it is on us, I think, to just explore and try things out, recognise what we don't like, try and cut that out or reduce it, and then try and find out yeah, what we do no, enjoy absolutely. and then just do more of that kind of stuff, isn't it? And just be explorative yeah, and no, playful. Absolutely. You know, um, life's just... It's, I think life's too precious to just be... Ab- no, absolutely. To, to be content and doing something I think, that we don't you know, like want. you said, you could compare yourself yeah, to someone in uni and being like, oh, you know, should I have done it? But people in uni might be saying the same thing about you then, being like, oh was doing a degree really the right thing for me? Am I actually sure this is what I want to do with my life? Or do I wish I'd done a different degree? I think we're all always comparing ourselves to the opposite as well, a lot of the time. So like we're not just comparing ourselves sometimes to the people that are on the same field or on the same kind of trajectory as us. We'll be like, oh, well, they're, you know, someone who's in a nine to five job, we're like, oh, they're self-employed. Is that better? And then, and then the person who's self-employed is thinking, oh, would well, a nine to five, you know, be better? You know, there's always going to be, little doubts in your mind which make you compare yourself to other people other things but they're doing exactly the people you're comparing yourself to are also comparing themselves maybe to you or to somebody else so there's like that kind of domino effect anyway so it's not what you know why are we all comparing ourselves like what what is the goal it's not going to fix anything i don't think you know like by comparing yourself to somebody it's not going to fix your problems it's just making more for you in your mind really so it's kind of like a self-sabotage kind of thing that we do for some reason <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yeah it's the, yeah the, the grass is greener sort of mentality it is isn't it and funny enough I was, while you were saying it then I was thinking about an example um wh- whenever I go surfing <clears throat> and I think anyone who surfs will probably have, um you know resonate with this as well when you're in the water and the waves are coming you kind of look in it like straight ahead you're like why are the, why are the waves not coming here and then you look to the left or the right and you're like, they look much bigger down there. And yeah. you're, you're tempted to just you know, you know, swim with your board halfway along the beach to try and catch where these waves look much better. But the truth is, those waves on the, like further down the beach, sometimes they are a bit bigger, but most of the time, yeah. it's just the, your perspective of the wave. So rather, yeah. Yeah, rather than looking at it straight on, you're looking at it to you know at an angle, and it just looks much bigger and much better when you look at it from that you know, perspective. Mm. But I think that that's almost like metaphorical yeah, I like, I like that. of, I like of that little, life in general. Yeah, like when that's, something's that's, straight That's the nice way to put it, actually. You said it's, it's perspective, mm. right? Like that's what it comes down to. And, you know, you could you could want something that someone's got, but actually they mm. the person that's got it doesn't even want it. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it is all about the perspective of, of that you have. So, yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well, I'll be using that. <laughs> Copyright, Ryan mm. Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I love a good surfing example to be fair or surfing metaphor is it, is it, it's weird I don't know I've done something I said something about it before mm. surfing there's so many little lessons you can take from surfing as an entire sport like patience so like you know you, you're going to be waiting for ages and ages before you actually get a good wave and then when you try swimming you're like am I in the right place you know which represents opportunity like am I in the right place at the right time sort of thing you know then you put the effort in so you swim in and you're like right you know how much effort have I got to put in you know and for and for how long and then if you do that extra one or two strokes you push a little harder and you might actually catch the wave and then when you catch it that's like one percent of the time you're in the water and you get this amazing rush of adrenaline and all the endorphins are flying around you just because you feel you know you feel great for catching it and I feel like that's sort of representative of life you know most of the time we spend being patient and waiting around and checking for opportunities, missing some and then, you know, seeing another one and then putting the effort in. And then, you know, it almost, that that little catch in the wave represents success Mm -hmm. in our particular endeavours. Like when you graduate from university, boom, you feel amazing, you're on that pedestal. But all the work and the effort you've put in has has come before. And, and you know, it really is about the journey. You know, I think we set ourselves that mountain to get to or get on top of, but... You know, all the good stuff happens when you're on the way there. You know, all of the effort and the struggle and the challenges that you will have to overcome. I think that's that. That's what it's really about. It's just sometimes we we we're all looking for that podium. We're all looking for that the top of that hill to get there. Not you know forgetting that there's a yeah. And I think it's like it's like the reward is always such a short like 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 using surfing. You know, you could be in the water for two hours and maybe only catch one really good wave. Do you know what I mean? So it's like two hours work for one wave, you know, and that's that's sometimes the ratio of things. Like people 
don't realize how much you've got to put in to get something out sometimes and mm. it's a lot and i think that's why so many people fall short of it there and they they it's too much work you know it's too much work so they they, they never they never get there you know Mm -hmm. it, it can, it can, that kind of leads me on to mm -hmm. one of the other things I want to talk about, which is like habit setting and consistency. So like, um, I mean, with you, with your training, with your content po uh, posting, um, so, so like from an outsider's perspective, it <laughs> seems like you've got like consistency Maybe. nailed down quite well. And also, you know, in terms of training and habit setting, it just seems like you've got it good. Um, I mean, <laughs> what 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 do you tend to find works for you? Like, so when you want to set a goal, let's just say, uh, with, with your training or you or you know, yeah, with your, with your training with the triathlons, is it like right every Monday and Wednesday I'm going to be doing this, or is it like right I'm going to try and do a little bit every single day, like or content creation? Have you got a specific day that you tend yeah. to do it, or just as and when? Do you know what I mean? What kind of what works for you? Because for content for me, I, I write my email on a Thursday, send it out on a Friday, or sometimes I send do it on a Friday and send it out then on a Friday. Um, yeah. But in terms of content yeah, yeah. creation, I just do it as and when because that just works for yeah. my chaotic brain. But yeah. what so do in you regards feel to is training, helpful for you? In, I've in always of trained, and I think I've always been able to to keep it pretty consistent. Just be mainly it used to be consistency because I off the eating disorder, and I, if I didn't do it, you know, it was like I was really bad. Now what keeps me consistent is one having a coach, so I'm accountable. So he 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 takes all the guesswork out for me. He gives me the plan for the week, and I just do it. <laughs> um, so like you know, I meant to I meant to have swam this morning. I might do it later, but I also might might text him and ask for a recovery day. We'll see. Um, but yeah, that that's the training's like the easy part for me. I've always done it. I don't have to think about it. Or sometimes you know, sometimes I don't want to do it. You know, but I'll I'll do it because. If I haven't done it, you can see I haven't done it. You know, I can't, I can't lie my way through that one. It's, it's either, it's either done or it's not. In regards to like content, so I think I started really optimistically. Like I'm gonna put five posts out a week on both Get Bent Yoga and the Metal Toolbox, and it's just not, it's not doable. It's as you know, it takes a lot of time sometimes to put bits together for for content. You know, it does. It's so time consuming. Um, mm. So I, what I've come to learn is start really small so at the minute i'm just committing to one or two posts a week and it's way more manageable i tend to do it as and when because sometimes i struggle with my creativity and sometimes i'll be in a like a flow and i'll be like yeah yeah and i'm getting all this content out and i'm like you know planning it all and then the next day i'll have no ideas do you know what i mean so i try and go with the flow with it as my time allows so when i feel like i'm in a good like flow state i'll just bash out a load mm -hmm. get them ready to you know to you know, I put them on an app that uploads them then, like scheduled and stuff. Um, because what I find hard with consistency is I do so many things. Like if I've got a uni deadline coming up, that has to come priority then. So I, it's, it's more like a priority thing as well. You know, I I tend to on a Sunday, I try I try my best to like sit down. But like, OK, what is like my priority three tasks I have to do this week? If it's uni, uni is probably the first one training happens every day I don't even think of that as an actual thing to add into my life that's just life now that's just that's just normal like I'm like really grateful that's just become part of my part of my life now um and then it's like content will be you know usually third it's not it's never my, my priority because it's not something like it's not my bread and butter it doesn't make me money it's just my passion so you know for now it's it's bottom of the of the ladder with a lot of things it's the first thing to go if I haven't got the time but Usually I've got some like backup posts and I can reuse some and I've got like, you know, I've done many videos like this where I can just cut bits and just quickly upload it and stuff. So yeah, it's, it's hard to keep tabs on it all. It doesn't help that I have two Instagram accounts. So I need to like kind of mash them into one somehow, compare, you know, bring in athletic yoga and mindset stuff into one account and I'd be winning. So that's the next task, I think. <laughs> And uh, well, that that's cool actually, yeah. Because like you do find that, then you sometimes it's like right, yeah. I'm, set, I'm making this separate thing, so I'm gonna put it over here right now. But yeah, if you yeah. can try and yeah. figure out ways to then optimize your time and optimize the uh, yeah. results, it makes a lot of um, sense. Like I, I kind of done that with my personal Instagram and my uh, coaching one. So I was putting things on the coaching one, which I thought, well, you know, I, I wouldn't really want to put this up on my personal one as such, just because I don't feel like the content's gonna be as relevant. But then. I started to realize mm -hmm. most of the people who were following my anyway. work account 
they'd be following my personal accounts anyway and they would be filtering through and whatever and I just thought well I'm just doubling the effort here you know and people didn't really understand the yeah. difference between the two anyway I think people were probably like why have you got two uh, pretty much the same name so I thought well in the end I just molded merged them together yeah. and I just post um on yeah post everything on that one it makes it a lot of e a lot easier I think just because you've only got that one to manage but mm -hmm. um I, I like I, I like the prioritizing thing. Like that's quite important. I think right, recognizing right this is this is priority number one. And I think just to add on to that as well, how you sort of determine those priorities yeah. is going to yeah, be like absolutely what they're bringing for you long term, isn't it? So like the why yeah. why are you doing yeah. it? like you know if you're doing the degree, mm -hmm. it's like okay, well that's going to lead into that future career and that future person you want to become. So I think for somebody probably looking at okay, where do I, st or what do I need to pr be prioritizing? Yeah, it is going to be those things that are feeding into that long-term vision um, rather than the stuff that necessarily that's going to be just yeah. short-term gain. Like, I think you have got to dance between the two of you. Like, if you need to, yeah. I don't know, do something specifically for money, um, then, yeah, okay, if you need money mm -hmm. now, then that's got to take a certain amount of precedent, especially more so if you're, like, if you need the money there and then, but... I think anything where you can mm -hmm. look for those long-term um, outcomes. Yeah, that's it. There's a, a word yeah, I'm yeah. looking for for this, actually, isn't it? It's like delayed gratification. Is that the one, maybe? Yeah. yeah so, like, if you can try and f do those things more well, often, I think that's, yeah. That's be that's better it with my mental toolbox anyway. stuff. Like, like I said, it's not a moneymaker for me. It's something I'm passionate about. I want, I want to help people. That's the one thing I know in regards to working is that all I want to do is help people mm -hmm. in some way, um, whatever that looks like. And... You know, it might not make me, you know, an income, but it's like you said, it's delayed gratification. Eventually, hopefully it will. And, you know, you've got to start somewhere and I need to, you know, you've got to have exposure. You've got to get people connecting with you. Otherwise, you've got nobody to help. You know what I mean? Like, I need people to to know that I'm there to help so that in the future I can hopefully use my degree and and use that to, to do some more good in the world, for sure. That's uh, and like it comes back to figuring out what you what what makes you tick, doesn't it? Like I think that's one of the greatest lessons I've learned. Is, no, but I know um, of the book. Have you read "Start with mm -hmm. Why" by Simon Sinek? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the TED Talks is probably is a good one to watch as well. It's like twenty minutes long or something. But yeah, it's yes. it seems as though you've probably done that then, like just just naturally. Like whereas I think he he talks about it, and I was like when I read the book, yeah. and I listened to the TED Talk, I was like, oh. My God, I was like, I've been doing it all wrong all along, you know, um, just chasing money or status or respect, you know, rather than actually yeah. trying to figure out, okay, well, why am I doing this in the first place? Oh, I'm not doing yeah. this because it's helping anybody. I'm doing it because it's going to earn me money. Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, what if the money's not coming in? Am I still going to enjoy it? Do I still yeah. want to do it then? And nine times out of 10, the answer is going to be no. And as soon as I started realizing that, I started thinking, okay, well, what, what do I do for free or what would I do for free? And how can I do that? And then potentially do, you know, make a living from it. Um, and that's yeah. kind of like what got me into doing, just, just pursuing different avenues. Then I thought, well, yeah, this is stuff that I do yeah, for amazing. free. So if you can get paid for doing it, like talks in schools mm -hmm. and that, I love that. I'd happily do that all day for free, you know, so, but it's, You've got to kind of, yeah, just, just really now. I've, I've done a few workshops and seminars and with Tony Robbins them, and yeah. Dean Graziosi, and they did something called the seven step clarity tool, which is like when you're asked, so when you're working with a client and they want, they say, I want to, I don't know, I want to lose 10 stones, say, for example. And it's okay, ask them, why? You know, why do you want to lose 10 stone? And they'd be like, oh, because I want to look thinner. It's like, okay, well, why do you want to look thinner? And they, like, eventually you get to that raw like reason behind it and a lot of the time it's because because I want to feel loved or it's something like a lot deeper than just I want to look a certain way and that's I love the word why and my dad's always you know one of my things my dad always says is you were the girl that always asked why growing up like I, my dad would say something I'd be like why and like he was like for frick's sake like I'm running out of like answers here because everything would be the why oh Maddie right we're gonna have we're gonna go out for dinner tonight oh why and, like it was always I questioned everything and I kind of lost that as an adult, but I'm like bringing it back now. Like you lose that kind of curiosity. You lose that kind of wanting to know more. And the last few years, yeah, I've definitely gone back to, okay, well, why, why, 
why am I doing something? I asked myself that with jiu-jitsu. I was like, why am I actually doing it? Do I actually really enjoy it? I was like, I don't think I do anymore. So like, well, why am I doing it? And I was like, well, people know me as a jiu-jitsu girl, so I'm just going to keep doing it because of status. Like, that's what people, they saw Maddie, they saw jiu-jitsu. Like, probably now people see Maddie in triathlon, you know. That that was it for a, a, a while of my life. And I think you kind of get connected to those, what was it, not roles, but kind of, well, titles, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think asking yourself why can can help you cut your losses sometimes you know like why am i doing something if i don't actually have any purpose or, or want to do it you know mm. that's yeah, that it is it's such an important word like now and now you've said it like that yeah i mean it's it, it's almost like the yeah. The precursor to an introspection, isn't it? It was the the thing that le- you know triggers um, mm-hmm. introspection is when you question, okay, well, why? Why am I doing this? Or why am I doing that? Or why am I thinking that? Or and and yeah, if you just keep on doing it, keep on doing it. it, it I, I also say, like, I mean, when we ask someone a question, they are gonna, the, yeah. their brains are gonna start turning to try and present us with an answer aren't they? And, and it's the same when we ask ourselves a question as well. If we can't figure out what we want to do or how we feel about something, if we just sit with the thought and we ask those sorts of like open questions, like, mm-hmm. well, what, what is this going to bring me? Or what is this, what does this mean to me? And da, 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 whatever, just ask those individual questions because when we ask that question to ourselves, it's the same as if someone else has asked us, we're going to try and formulate a response to, to give an answer. And I think, we're more likely, in my opinion, we're more likely to to try and lie to someone else about if we if you know if we don't want to yeah. give a particular answer, we're more likely to lie. Whereas with ourselves, we we might try and lie, yeah. but uh, we we've got our bullshit uh, radar up a bit more, and we we kind of if we yeah. try and get feed ourselves some bullshit answer, we're like no 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 you're, you're lying right now. This is not the real answer, and I, I feel like when we start doing that, we can start to just come up with these different answers that are going to really enrich our lives mm-hmm. and, ch- and change oh, how we feel. Absolutely, yeah. And, no, I, I totally get that. Yeah, just absolutely. You can't lie to yourself because you know, that like, you know, I'm like, you, you, I just, you just know. You can say, like, it's like when you flip a coin and you, you don't, don't know what where you want to go, you know, A or B, so you know, like heads or tails. When that coin's in the air, you know what you want in that moment. And it's like, if you, if you lie to yourself, you're like, I know, I'm, you just know you're lying to yourself, you know, that you can't. You can't bullshit your way out of it through yourself, you know. It's it's just that it's 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 like within. It's kind of innate within you. Hmm. Yeah, hundred percent. And so, yeah, re- recommendation for anyone listening or watching. Yeah, start with why. Highly, highly recommend getting on that. It's just it, it definitely answered a lot of questions for me. Um, I think it probably will for you guys as well. I mean, so another one thing I wanted to talk about with you is... Um, I love boundaries. Well, is it boundary? Yeah, so boundaries, yeah. actually. Uh, it was a post... You've done another, yeah, you did a post on it, I think. And yeah, I, I, like, yeah, I, I know got, that you uh, love... a deep dive on there. You've done a few things about that. I've put it on my page. But yeah, I've got like a, like a... I think it's about a 45 minute long kind of mm, like deep dive yeah. on boundaries. It's, yeah, interesting stuff. Mm. <laughs> we'll do 45 minutes on you now as well <laughs> um, so I mean to, to give a bit of an insight into it I mean for yeah. someone so there's two different sides to it mm-hmm. I think isn't it you've got boundaries with yourself and you've got boundaries with other people so like you know how do you how, how, how do you so if we start with yourself first of all how do you set like healthy boundaries with yourself in terms of maybe the time that you're putting into certain things yeah. or, or yeah, anything Well, like it's that. interesting you bring up boundaries that, because it's the one thing I really struggle with. Boundaries. I grew up in a home where there were, wasn't any boundaries, you know. So I never really never knew boundaries. I would over always overstep other people's boundaries because I just didn't see them there. I didn't see the boundary unless it was like, this is my boundary. I don't see, I didn't, it's like I was kind of socially a bit awkward and I don't understand boundaries very well, you know. Mm. Never did until I met Sam, my boyfriend, and I remember him sitting me down one day. He had he said boundaries because like I bought my you know, when I moved in, I had my dogs here. He never had dogs. He he had boundaries in place in regards to the dogs, you know, like they're not sleeping in the bed, they're not doing this. And I was mm. a bit like, holy shit, this is a lot to take in because I was like, 
he's laying his boundaries, but I didn't know how, to, I felt a bit like attacked and it wasn't him attacking me. It was just him going, this is, this is my rules around it. You know, we can chat about them. We can, you know, they're up for debate, but like, this is where I'm coming from. And I was a bit taken aback. I was a bit like, well, I need a minute with this because no one's ever presented boundaries like that to me before. You know, I didn't get that from my mum and dad. They were so hippie, cool, chill, you know, like anything went with them. And that's how I've always been. Like, there's no, there's just no boundaries in me. And, um, it took me a lot of soul searching to figure out that they're in one, they're bloody important because I, what well, I was, I was a yes gal. You know, I said yes to everything, which is great. Sometimes it does not give, you know, you're taking up more opportunities, but it's also exhausting when you're saying yes to everything and you're expecting to be all these places and do all this stuff. And it's like, when is there time for you? So I think boundaries really ex- are really um, important just for your own sanity. I think having those boundaries in place with people and making sure you verbalise them and keep them yourself is important because otherwise it can lead to massive resentment, you know. If, you know, you say yes to something and then you don't want to do it and the person's, you know, late there and you're like, oh, you get really pissed off at them and stuff. But I think um, for me, setting boundaries with myself is the hardest now because of my time. And I, I am still quite a yes person. I, you know, I do like to take an opportunity if they come. Um but I have set the boundary of like Saturday is my day off, you know, that's that's my one hard boundary now. And um, where I'm like, no, that is my day off work. If anyone says it's Saturday, sometimes, you know, if I have a day off, like I have nothing to do and I'm like, oh, do you know what? I haven't got plans and someone needs me to cover a class because they're ill. I'll jump in, of course, but I will never have like consistent work on a Saturday now, which is took me years. It's actually because of COVID that that's come to fruition, really, because I was forced to take time off work. I was like, ah. Oh, this is, I've gone the other way now. So I've gone from being like working seven days a week to, well, like two days a week. Let's find that happy medium going back. So that that's my main boundary is with my time and around work because I do work a lot. Um, but now I haven't got the time because I've trained the new knee. So it's like, <laughs> I'm trying to like navigate now this new kind of, what does my day, what does my like daily routine look like? Because it's, there's so many like pies that I'm <laughs> trying to juggle at the moment. Um, in regards to other people, that's something as a work in progress for myself. Like, I'm such a chill person. I haven't got many boundaries in regards to other people and me, but other people do. So I'm trying to I'm trying to really notice other people's boundaries now. That's something that I've been really actively working on. And I think it's healthy to have boundaries, and it's so toxic if you don't. You know, I don't know about yourself and how you are with boundaries, but like they're they're there for a reason, and it's not and the hardest thing is knowing someone's boundary and then res- keeping it like respecting it because you know you could tell me your boundary but I could just as easily break that boundary or, or overstep that boundary with you because I don't know how to respect boundaries it's not because I'm a dick it's just because I don't mm. it, it sounds really silly but it's sometimes like I don't like I just don't understand I need like someone to really explain that boundary to me so that I know okay what what I'm, it's a why it's a why question again if you said to me <laughs> do not Maddie like I don't know I don't want to meet you in person. I want to do it on video, right? Like we've done it today because of time. And I was like, no, but I want to see you in person. You're like, no, Maddie, I need, I need to know every little, but why, right? Like, why don't you want to do it in person? Or why is this? Like, and it could just be something simple like, oh, I can't be asked to drive out anywhere today. So I want to do it from the comfort of my own home or whatever. But I, I need to know the why, 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 why. And that's been really helpful with Sam because he's really good at explaining things to me. And it's been like, it's it's funny how someone who doesn't have like the background in like mental well-being, he's just been able to like teach me something that is so normal and just a part of his life that to me it's like alien. It's like, wow. But now I've been doing like workshops on it and I've been really educating myself around boundaries. It's like, it's all starting to click and I'm helping other people set boundaries, which is like, okay, well, I'm doing something right, you know? Which is which is amazing to see. It's, it's a, that's why I wanted to ask you about it because, like you said, it's um, it's something that I'll be honest. I'm not like mm-hmm. I, I have. It's only in recent years, probably in the like last year or so, maybe year and a half. Yeah, uh, probably since I started doing this kind of stuff. Like where I've I've been familiar with yeah. the term, and then I've been a little bit more sort of like conscious about. The, the yeah like the boundaries within my own life that I'm setting with myself or with other people so like work boundary is a good example like you said about not working on a Saturday I think me I've done it over the years where I've worked to like early hours of the morning on to like business projects and things like that 
and it's it's good because it's exciting and if you've got other work on where it's limiting the amount of time you can invest in something like that then you want to pour whatever spare time you've got into it but you've got to understand then I think what I did is that okay well this is going to actually mess me up in other areas of my life so my training is going to go out the window because my sleep's going to be you know like damaged because I'm not I'm staying up later and you know not getting good quality sleep and there's there's a knock-on effect like that and I think you've got to weigh it up and go well hang on do I value my health more or do I value setting this business up more and 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 then setting a boundary which is like right okay I'm not working on the laptop past 10 o'clock that's my limit or whatever it is you know Mm -hmm. once you set those those rules but I think writing them down and establishing them or even putting them in your calendar is is good or like alarms people do alarms get off your phone or whatever yeah yeah uh saying get to bed or put the laptop down yeah get off your phone yeah those sorts Mm -hmm. of ones and what one that I struggle with is the one with other people Mm -hmm. which is I did an email on this Friday, which is about protecting your energy, which I think feeds into it as well. Setting a boundary with with other people mm-hmm. that, you know, right, okay, so in the mornings, yeah. I don't answer my phone. Right? And that's I, not the case for me. I just mean, like, hypothetically, mm-hmm. if I was to set a boundary with other people, it could be look like that. It could be like, right, I don't answer my phone before 9 o'clock or I don't answer my phone before 10 o'clock. You know, if you need to contact me, drop me a message or whatever. You know, that, so that's you setting a boundary both with yourself and with other people. So it's saying, mm-hmm. right, okay, well, the mornings are my time. I want to be meditating, training, or whatever it is. And yeah. then after that, I'm available. Yeah. And, and that, that's the key word there, I think, available. We're all too available at the moment yeah. and in recent years because, you know, people, exactly. when they didn't have mobile phones, yeah. when they clock off from work or leave the office, yeah, you can't get hold of them. You know, you might be able to ring the house phone, but you wouldn't really tend to do that unless it's like an emergency. Whereas now, yeah. you can easily drop a message on WhatsApp, on Slack, on Telegram, on Instagram, Facebook, whatever, whatever or just call people, and you don't think twice about it. And my father, he's a nightmare for it. Like he will get phone calls from work. Um, you know, he works. As, he's a postman, right? So. He gets phone calls from his managers or from other people in the office or whatever at like nine ten in the night just to talk about random stuff about relating to work. Work. You're allowing yourself to be available, like though, isn't it? Like, and that's it where well. the resentment comes in, like, then. Like, that is just because you haven't put that you, hard boundary up. You're like, oh, this is what's yeah. going to mess with me. It's like, yeah, well, you need to tell them no, otherwise it's going to keep happening, mm. right? And it's that's that is the the bottom line. You've got to be like, this is this is like my rules for how. It's like giving someone a manual with how to communicate or work with you. You know, it's like this is how I work. This is what this is what I do. Like read it, <laughs> read it, and then like th- now you know how to interact with me. Now you know like when it's okay to contact me when it's not. You know, obviously inside of work hours, you're allowed to be contacted, but your time should be your time, right? Mm, yeah, and, and mm. with a relationship as well, like you mentioned there, I think. It's, it's such an important thing to, to really narrow down at the start. Like, it might seem a little bit, um, you know, I, I suppose yeah. with a friendship, you know, you don't want to really sit them down and be like, right, this is how I work, you know. You've got to, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just something that happens more naturally. And I think, you know, if there is something where, you know, I don't know, someone says something and you're like, oh, look, you know, I don't really like you doing that. For example, there was one uh, person who... Um, when I was running the Ideas and Beers events, they said something uh, in in the WhatsApp group, which was like, you know, just a bit of a, like, taking the mix sort of thing, a bit of a joke. But I said, look, I messaged them privately, I said, look, can you yeah. not do that? Only because it's about non-judgmental, uh, being non-judgmental, it's about, um, you know, positively, positively encouraging other people in their ideas and things like that. And when mm-hmm. you're putting that in there, even though it's meant as a joke, other people are like, like, you know, finding it funny and whatever, and it sets a precedent for other people to do the same, and then it also then will subconsciously, or well, potentially yeah. subconsciously, it's like takes um, away that safe space, stop isn't it? From feeling like they can be expressive in the group, and and it is, yeah. So it's just, and it was just like setting that boundary initially before it kind of envelops into something else. 
Um, so that, that, so that was a, yeah. I'm going to move. By the way, I've got a bit of extra time because my clients have to cancel. I'm just going to put my phone on charge right here. <laughs> so I, so I, just so I don't completely die on you mid, mid conversation. There we go. <laughs> but yeah, um, relationships, that, that I think that's what I was going to say is the, um, with friendships is different, but with relationships, like romantic relationships, if you kind of sit down when you're actually things are maybe you know at the start you want to talk a little bit about it i think but also as you get into things um a bit further then it's good to have that sort of sit down you know chat um because it's you're like oh actually we're feeling like this is going somewhere um yeah. and then you're just laying down the law then so it's like expectations from from the other person and also from yourself um because it really it stops a lot of it yeah, stops a lot of absolutely. arguments, it stops a lot of animosity. It's almost like having a contract with a business partner. You know, you have a contract with a business partner, with clients and whatever, so that they know their expectations, you know your expectations. And then it also gives you the sort of, gives you the right, or well, not necessarily the right, but gives you the, uh, you know, the ability then yeah. to step in and say something if those contract terms are not met. And I think that is essentially... Yeah, it's just opening a conversation, really, isn't it? Like, you, like you said, like, you know, like what, is, what is okay and what is not. And, you know, I think, like, people like myself who haven't been able to set boundaries or recognise them or, or you know, or not, not respect them, because I do respect them, but to, to follow them follow them your own through more than anything. Mm. You know, I can respect other people's, but I don't always respect my own boundaries. So I'm like, oh, I can, you know, I can handle that late night of working when I know I should be in bed or whatever. And I think... It comes down. It comes really down to people that do struggle with their boundaries or setting mm. them for themselves, especially is because you're a people pleaser. And I know I'm a people pleaser. I always have been. Like I, said, I always said yes, and um, that's a big part of it. Like a, a lot of people that struggle with boundaries, they tend to be people pleasers because they feel like if they say no, then they're offending the other person. But actually, you might, you know, might you might make that person. You know, you could ask me, Maddie, can you? I don't know make me dinner one night for whatever reason. And I'm like, oh, I really don't want to, I'm busy. But I'm like, yeah, I'll do that because I want to I want to please you. But then I'm finishing work at eight o'clock, cooking you a bloody meal. I'm like, oh, what a dick, Ms. Ryan is. And you've done nothing wrong. You've asked me a question. I've said yes. What I should have said is actually, Ryan, I can't do it. I'm, like, I'm really, really fatigued. That's a really busy day for me on, on Wednesday or whatever. But I'm resenting you, but you've done nothing wrong. It's, I, it's myself that I should be angry at, if you know what I mean. It's... And it, it happens so often. I see it with people with their bosses, you know. They like they agree to work overtime mm. or whatever, but then they're pissed off about it. I'm like, well, you said yeah. You know, like, yeah, okay, it's shit, but you said yes. You can't blame your boss. Like, he asked or she asked, you said yes, and that, that's the way <laughs> it is. And there's so many good exercises you can do on this. Um, I'll have to link you up with them like, for my page again, and you can share them, um, helping people just how to understand boundaries. So I think understanding boundaries is paramount. We've like, touched on it today, but it does go a lot deeper. Um, and then I think sometimes sitting with yourself and be like, okay, well, what are my boundaries? And the interesting thing with boundaries, you have like hard boundaries and you can have like soft boundaries and a hard boundary is like, you know, something that, that is the way it is. So for example, with using my dogs as an example, one like hard boundary was like they cannot sleep in the bed because there's not enough room for two people, a husky and a dog, you know, another dog, you know, it's just not going to happen. Whereas the soft boundary is like, right, the dogs, um, can only go in the garden if they're being watched because we have little walls, they could jump. But that's like a soft boundary because after time, that boundary isn't needed anymore because the dogs are safe in the garden. We know they're not going to jump out. So, that you know, boundaries, they might be set around something, but it doesn't mean they're fixed. They should still be able to be discussed with respect, for example. You know, like if, if someone set a boundary with me and I kept questioning it, that's me not respecting it, obviously. You know, there's got to be that mutual respect there. Um, but just because a boundary set doesn't mean it's, it should be fixed forever. There should be that communication somewhere down the line that if one party is really unhappy with that boundary in, in, in a relationship, for example, that it could be discussed. Like, there's got to be that meet in the middle at the end of the day, isn't there? There's got to be that compromise. Com compromise, oh, yeah. yeah, that is the key word there. That is one, uh, one big lesson that I learned in business, yeah. you know, is that uh, you've got to have compromise with business, with relationships, with everything. And, mm -hmm. and it, yeah. yeah, it's... I think once we when once we've got something in our heads like oh this is the way that I want this to go or this is the way that I feel someone yeah. with a lack of compromise 
is it's almost impossible to get through. Uh, you know, to, 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 to meet that middle ground, isn't it? You like if you you're with somebody in mm-hmm. a business or within like a romantic relationship, and you can't find that sort of like middle ground, that compromise. It's it's it, yeah. I mean, it, it's worth reviewing it and actually thinking, okay, is this you know, am I going to continue with this? Because um, you know, it, it comes back to like stubbornness. I've got a friend who's the most stubborn person you'll know, and I and I honestly can't even begin to think what he's like in a relationship <laughs> because you know that that compromise there yeah. if there's an argument and he feels like he's not in the wrong he will like argue to the death probably mm-hmm. uh, rather than actually taking ownership of the part that he had to play in it and yeah it's mm-hmm. like compromise just looks like saying oh actually look i could have done this slightly better but this is how i feel about it and this is how i feel maybe you know things could have been different on your side and then sort of meeting that compromise in the middle. And I think, you know, it's just, yeah, having that open discussion. But you've got to be open to it rather than just... Yeah, I think the problem is someone can, like, open that discussion of, like, okay, I'm not happy with this. The other person feels mind, attacked. But it? that's, I think, again, that just comes down to being vulnerable and being open to to critique, you know? Like, mm. some, you know, you're not always perfect. And some people are going to pull you up on your shit. And you've got to be willing to listen, even though you don't want to hear it. And that's, I think that's a lot of people find that. I know mm. I am really stubborn. And if someone pulls me up on something, I'd love to say mm. I take it really well. I don't. I, I feel, I do feel attacked. And I think you get a bit triggered or, you know, emotionally activated by it. And when that happens, it's like, okay, is there truth behind it? You know, when you feel attacked, or t- you know, attacked by somebody because they've pulled you up on something, it's like, okay, well, they've hit a nerve here. So there must be, there's got to be some truth around it or some emotion around it. Like, let's unpack it. Let's have a discussion around it because I think you can learn so much from yourself, from yourself, you know, like from how you react to things and how different things make you feel like, you know, it's always interesting to go, go a little bit deeper and be like, okay, well, why do I feel that way about what they said? You know, has, has this been said to me before? Like, is this a bit of a reoccurring thing? You know, cause I know people mm. have said things to me in the past and I'm a bit like, you know, I get my back up for one because they said something that I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy with and I, I let it go you know I forget about it but then maybe a year later I'm in a similar situation and the same thing is said to me and I'm like okay maybe I am the problem here maybe there is something I need to work on here because this isn't the first time I've been in this situation clearly I have some work to do here and the problem with me is it has to happen a couple of times before I actually take it on board but I'm starting to be like okay something's triggering me a bit or some someone said something and I'm a bit like I don't, know, I don't like what they said there and now it's like okay let's let's go into it and usually then you're able to navigate and figure out what's what yeah it's, it's mirroring isn't it like it's uh you know when you recognize mm-hmm. like you said that there's a there's there's something in someone else or something in the situation that's causing you that like a little, ooh, that little uh, bit of uncomfort uh, sorry discomfort um, or just doesn't feel right, you kind of go, yeah, when you unpack it, you start recognizing, yeah. oh, actually, this is what this is. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and it, I suppose it ties in with shadow work then as well, isn't it? So once you shine a light yeah. on it, you're not going to like what's in the shadows, but it's, you know, it, it's where all the growth happens. Um, yeah. And there's a quote I always love, like banging this quote out, right? I always use it quite often now, but um, like it's that, not mine, yeah. someone That's... else's. It's uh, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Yeah, yes. and, and it's, it's so relevant in, like, literal sense. Like, you know, if you're actually going into a cave, um, mm-hmm. you know, you might be like, oh, yeah. well, you know, a bit scared or whatever. But then once you do it, the growth that you get when you come back out of it is, is yeah. you know, good. But also, like, mentally or in a metaphorical sense, you know, the things that we're scared of, mm-hmm. the, the reason we're scared of them. Yeah, I think when you, when you go into those things, you start to come on the other discover side new of parts of yourself, and, uh, you know, it's... Yeah. Yeah. it's effectively inviting in change and we don't like change you know we are creatures of habit and change represents having to let go of something else usually or it represents stepping out of your current comfort zone which again we don't all like you know we we like to live in our comfort zones because we know it you know we know it's effectively safe there when a lot of the time it's actually holding you back and you know like some of the darkest things I've been through in my own healing and some were like you know I've been on my living room floor like crying and doing shaking med- and all these weird stuff like and it's been painful and it's been tough and it's been like like 
as cliche as it sounds, life changing. Like because it's it's changed my perspective of myself and therefore of the world, and it's taken me on a new path purely because I've gone into those dark places, which needed to be like well a light shine upon them. And and since doing so, it's like oh that part of me's like died. You know that that part of me that was holding me back is gone now, and I've now opened room for like so many more amazing things. They call it the dark of the night soul. Yeah. Yeah, you've got <laughs> it's, it's got it's got to start with you, hasn't it? It's got to start with the you know uh, you, as you were saying that, I was just thinking about the um uh the Michael Jackson yeah. song, uh the lyrics, the uh what's it called like um starting with the man in the mirror, asking him to change his ways. And it's yeah, like, you know, what he says there about change, if you yeah. want to change the world, so if you want to make make the world a better place, yeah, take a look at yourself and make a change. Yeah, it's it's so true. Like I I honestly think what what you're doing now, and the people that you're helping, like you, you know you know this yourself is like it's a direct result of those moments, like you said, where you've just been sitting there and like, you know crying or having a, a sense of uncertainty and and going through the, the motions, but. I think when you look back on it then retrospectively you can see how mm-hmm. you know how, how it was important for you to be the person you are now and also what's come from that which is the ability that you've got to actually help and impact other people you know on a massive scale mm-hmm. and you know that it, it, in a sense it should give you the, like that 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 sense of gratitude for like oh my god this is you know this, this is this is cool how like you know we've got to, we've got to that stage um, but for somebody who's kind of going through the mill and going through the motions now, yeah, ju- just recognizing, okay, well, if I can become 1% mm-hmm. better today than I was yesterday or 1% more informed or knowledgeable than I, you know, today than I was yesterday, it, it's small, but it's, it's continu- it's sorry, small progress, but over the course of weeks, months, years, that ends up being a complete difference, you know, to, to your life. Yeah. That, I think is in the, the compound effect book. He gives three examples of like say John Terry and bloody Tim, I don't know, three different people. And you know, he said they're all three friends. Now John, he just doesn't change anything in his life. He just kind of keeps on going going about his business and doing what he's doing. Second guy, Tim, he um he starts going out on the weekends a little bit more often. He starts yeah. socially smoking and he I don't know, has a takeaway every monday night right something like that and then the last guy whoever it was tim he um third the third guy anyway uh he starts listening to an audiobook on his way to work he starts training in the gym two or three yeah. times a week and he starts uh or he goes let's say sit just say he adopts a veggie diet okay so like he's made a couple of little positive changes there now, over the course of six months for each of them, there's not much visible difference, you know. But over the course of then a year and then two years and then three years, you've got one which is sort of stagnating, you know, not much going on, not much changing. You've got the other one which is going on this downward trajectory, like they've maybe, you know, their health is declining because they've been drinking more often. You know, they've like developed an unhealthy relationship with smoking. That's potentially affecting them in other areas of their life as well. And then, yeah. you know, they might put on weight because of the, the takeaways. But then likewise, the, the, sorry, the other guy then might have had promotions with work from learning more about themselves through the audio books and whatever. They might, you know, be in good physical shape or have lost weight because of the mm-hmm. you know, dietary changes. Um, and they're very subtle differences, but like they do amount to quite a lot over the course of time. And it's just sort of, yeah, just, just recognizing that that small little change of switching from listening to music on your way to work to listening to an audio book or a podcast. Yeah, no, absolutely. It I think completely, like, I think like self, like self education, like, like time, you know, man number three, like just learning something new. It's, it's incredible. I and mean, it's not just good for your own knowledge. Like it's really good for your brain. It has its other kind of compounding effects as well. So I, that's what I do. I have one day, Monday usually when I need a bit of, you know, Monday motivation, I'll have my like, my happy playlist the playlist i literally dance in the car but then like tuesday to friday then it's it's a podcast and i go between two at the minute you know i usually go between a couple and i differentiate between them every day and i've learned so at the minute i'm really learning about stock market <laughs> it's really random but i find it really mm-hmm. interesting um and it's just like from listening to them episodes for the last month 
okay. or two. <laughs> I think, you know, at 20 minutes every time I drive, like I've learned so much, which usually just me mindless, you know, driving. And, you know, we drive from A to B all the time and, you know, we go into like kind of automatic mm. autopilot mode. You know, you, when you get somewhere, you're like, I don't even know how I got here, I just did. You know, you can't even remember where you stopped at a red light or whatever. But then like, it keeps you engaged, it keeps you present. Like, I think it's like, a practice of mindfulness you know listening to like audio books and stuff i think it's great and i don't actually remember why i started to listen to them I, i've always listened to music just because it's you know but I, I someone shared something on instagram like oh you know if you were listening to an audiobook every day and gave some kind of stats i was like oh good idea why haven't mm. i thought of that and it's like my go-to now i recommend it to everybody is finding a decent you know a, a podcast to listen to mm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, 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 it like it lodges into your subconscious, I think, doesn't it? Like, you know, some people I speak to, they say that mm -hmm. they don't feel like they get as much from an audio book or, or whatever as, as a book. And that might be the case because people learn differently. You know, some are more visual, some are, you know, um, you know, or, or, oral yeah. learners. And I think, it, it, but either way, it kind of gets lodged into your brain somewhere along the lines. Like, I listen yeah. to audio books and I might not be able to, like, yeah. actually think about some of the lessons I've learned from it but then I'll be speaking to somebody and then I'll just randomly come out with this you know yeah this bit of information that I've just digested from an audiobook like you know a couple of weeks or a couple of months earlier um you know and it all goes in somewhere but I think it just feeds into this overall person you're becoming um you know and, and I that I listen to music all the time and I just I I think the defining moment for me um I was listening to yeah. audiobooks at the time, but then I had that Spotify wrapped, you know, when it gives you all of your stats for the year. So, like, it came up and it was like, oh, you've listened to, <laughs> oh my God, I can't even remember. It was like, I think I'd spent 12 days. It might have even been more. I think it was 21 days. Yeah, it was 21 days of the year I had spent listening yeah. to music. And I was just like, oh my God, that's a lot. I was like, and I spent a lot of time in the car. And I'm always listening to music. How could I have spent that but time I did think better? About it. I thought, right, I've spent 21 yeah. days of, of the year listening to music. Yeah, I could, and I thought about the hours break, you know, across the whole 21 days. I thought if I had spent 50% of that or even 25% of that, you know, listening to audiobooks, don't get me wrong, I had listened to a lot, a lot that year. But, you know, if I just increased that margin for, you know, 25% extra on audiobooks, 25% less on music, it equates to like, days worth of audiobooks and podcasts and stuff mm -hmm. that you've digested which means there's so much more information yeah. that's actually like useful potentially whereas the music it changes your state of of mind which is still important and it kind of lifts you up yeah there's something the i do time, like i said really like audiobooks now but there's in terms of education i do it every day apply later three times on. a day i call it an energy breaker so first thing in the morning as soon as i got out of bed i go and put the kettle mm. on usually um well sometimes i meditate in bed then i go put the kettle on and i have an energy break and i just put my put my playlist on just for one song i just move my body whether i depending on how tired i am i either dance around the kitchen like a loony or i do like a yoga flow in the kitchen for like three four minutes until the song finishes and i do that again about lunchtime <laughs> when my energy's flopping and then i'll do it once more like late afternoon because i tend to work till like 7 8 p.m most nights and the rest and that's that's that is my music time so i know that's like my that's when i get to listen to my, my songs but then in between driving now it's strictly podcast and like you said i've learned so much between that and I, there's also a mental health one i listen to which she's which is an amazing lady from, I think from new zealand and she i think she's actually i asked her to dig it out i think she's done a podcast around like listening to podcasts um as, as a means of, of educating yourself. And she, I think she did some stats on how it helps the hippocampus mm. and the brain, which is associated with, well, as we get older, if it gets smaller, Alzheimer's and dementia are quite prevalent and stuff, um, and how to keep that healthier. And I think, you know, it's not just good, like I said, for your knowledge, listening to these podcasts, it's not just good for keeping you present. It's like good on a physiological level as well for your brain, which is a no brainer, right? If you, you know, if you can improve your brain health just by listening to something while you're driving, then why wouldn't you? You know, it's it's easy. You know, it's easy to do. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So like exercise is one of the best things that, to the, prevent uh, the, like the, the hip, our hippocampal volumes decreasing with age. So mainly aerobic um, exercise. 
to getting your heart rate up a little bit and mm. you know cycling walking running you know it's really good for your brain mm. it's pretty cool so mm. working out does keep your brain healthy <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I, I, I think it's a similar thing with, uh, like, you know, they talk about learning a new language or playing piano. Um, yeah. Apparently those are sort of, sort of really, uh, really impactful when it comes to, like, Alzheimer's or dementia and that particular part of the brain mm-hmm. which is associated with those or where, you know, where it kind of originates from, those sorts of issues, isn't it? I think if you um, train that part of the brain through learning a separate language or mm-hmm. through piano, there might be other yeah. methods as well. But they say that that part of the brain then starts expanding and growing, which means that it's, I'm guessing, not shrinking. Yeah, so not, what um, it comes down to, to like, having, to put it very basically, uh, is like something called cognitive reserves. Like so Alzheimer, as Alzheimer we get older, dementia. you know, our brain, there's parts that shrink anyway with age. We can't we can't stop that. Otherwise, we probably would live all forever, I guess, you know. Um, and when we start to get this shrinkage, we can tap into something called our cognitive reserves. But some people don't have any cognitive mm-hmm. reserves because they haven't challenged their brain through things like listening to... Um, to podcasts or challenging themselves with brain games or like I said learning language is a fantastic way to build up your cognitive reserve um, so those that have higher cognitive mm. reserves they say are less likely to have you know problems with the brain as they as they age because they can tap into those reserves you know it's like a, you know a camel can live in the desert because they have that reserve you know in their humps <laughs> if they didn't have those reserves they'd die you know they wouldn't have all everything they need you know, like like a whale with all its blubber. You know, it keeps it insulated, and they have they have that to break down. Or, or animals that have a lot of fat when they're um, hibernating and stuff, for example, um, they have those reserves to tap into. And the same with our brain, we need to build up our cognitive reserves now while we're young, fit, and healthy. And so then, when we are older, we can like tap into them to to keep us to keep us functioning, really. Yeah, I'll be, I'll put some posts up about it as well. It's pretty cool. The brain is pretty bloody cool. Like yeah. I'm going to do a little bit of research into it. <laughs> yeah, awesome. No, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It is. It really is. Cool. Um, I know you're the, uh, the, the client of one now, but I've only, I, I haven't got a massive amount of time mm-hmm. myself now. So I'm going to ask you for I have a quote, a but it's a long one, and I might butcher it unless I Google it quickly. Um, um, but it's by um, Baba Ramdas. If, uh, if possible. And the gist of it is... This comes a lot down to comparison, actually, of us comparing people. But it's something like you can go into, you can walk into a forest and you can see all these trees, and some of them are bent, and some of them are twisty, some of them are are chunkier, some of them are slimmer, some are taller, some are shorter. And you look at the trees and you just think, "Wow, what a beautiful tree!" And he says, when we walk away from from trees and we go to people, we we lose that, we lose that gratitude of things as they are, um, and we start to judge. And it's like. He says, I practice turning people into trees and seeing the beauty in all of them. I think that's a really nice quote. I've butchered it a bit, but it's a beautiful quote. I that's not word for word, but um, I'll, uh, I'll have to send it over to you later. And a book recommendation. Oh, no, no, that, that's awesome. I love that. That's really cool. There's a really good one by Dr. Nicole LaPera, and it's you... Oh, I think it's about self-healing. Mm-hmm. I have to think of the... the with that, I'll get it up for you now. It's a it's a fab book for anyone like struggling with their mental health um, or trauma specifically. Uh, repair a book. Da, 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 da. It, it it is okay. how to do the work. It's called for anyone struggling with trauma. I or, that like your number or one struggling book? mentally. I think it's a fantastic book. Um, teaching people how to self heal. I think it's a fantastic fantastic book. It's one of my favourites, and. But okay, maybe my number one book would be You Can Heal Your Life by, um, oh God, Louise Hay. Louise Hay. Uh, she's unfortunately no longer with us. She's a fantastic lady that used to help heal people with cancer, not just working like, medically, but in regards to psychologically and how teaching people how holding trauma in can actually cause disease in the body. It's She's yeah, a fantastic lady and a book that started me probably on my own like self-healing. Yeah, absolutely recommend Louise Hay. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I read one. it all the time, over and over again. That's, and it's yeah, got that's, some that's fantastic the one quotes in there. Again, they're really long, like dialogue, rather than quotes, but about planting seeds and how, 
how planting a seed that's something so small, like a tomato seed, you know, it's su- something so small, you don't get anything instantly, mm. you don't get that instant gratification. But then months down the line, you've got a freaking tomato bush and you have the fruits that yeah. to take yourself. And there's, yeah, she's, she's, fun, she's got a fantastic perspective in that book. Louise Hay, yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So you can heal your life by Louise Hay, yeah? We could do it, yeah. We could have to do more and double down on stuff. Do you know what? I could literally, <laughs> we, I reckon we could do a three hour podcast here easily. <laughs> yeah. 100%. Yeah, no, I'm d- definitely keen for that. I know we've touched on loads of different things here as well. Yeah. Um, and as we've been going along, yeah, I've made yeah. a couple of like little sort of um, footnotes or time stamps is probably the right word to put it just with some of the different things that we've we've touched on um you know so like self-love makes you feel good it doesn't make you feel good you know um the eating disorders boundaries energy the energy breaker one i love that i'm definitely going to try that myself um you know there's, there's i think yeah <laughs> i think i kind of i think i subconsciously do it already it's like when i get in the car i put trance on and i'm like right yeah let's go you know um at certain points mostly in the afternoon well most most of the day I will dive in and out between yeah. music and audio box, but in the afternoon when I'm feeling a bit sluggish, mm. I know that audio box are probably not going to go in. So I put that music on and it, and it, it that's a bit of an, of an energy breaker for me. But um, yeah, I think there's a lot of like really good stuff that's, you know, we talked about it in here. That's going to help a lot of people. So like, um, no, but if anyone has any questions, they will ask me, they can find me at um, like, underscore the little, mental like, toolbox on Instagram. My DMs are always know, open. I always get around to answering everybody. And if they have any, you know, things they want covered, I always put up a little post here and there. But, you know, if anyone's got any um, any questions or anything they want me to like double down on, like a topic, like boundaries, for example, if they drop it in the box, then I'll, I'll make some content around it. Hmm. With an underscore at the end, that's it. Yeah, get, yeah, get Ben Yoga. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And uh, your yoga page is get Ben Yoga. <laughs> it's it? funky. It's really funky. My friends help oh, me I'm pick it. To be fair, so cool. I can't take all the credit. <laughs> I love that name. <laughs> it's great. Get ben yoga. Uh, well, no, like you said, it's, it, it helps to have something catchy yeah, like that. Like thanks for having always, me. It's just yeah, it sticks in your brain. I think that's uh, it's important. Uh, but no, thank you very much for coming on, Matt. I do appreciate that. I'll have a nap know, now, especially after the weekend <laughs> as well, because I know we've had, we've had a hard awesome. couple of days. See you later, right? Really Mumble Centurion. So uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming on this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>